welcome, uh, Sir Lord Professor Dan Ariely, um, <laughs> to the show. I, I've been a sort of fan of yours for many, many, many years. Um, for those of you who don't know Dan, he's sort of almost one of the godfathers of behavioural science. He's a professor, professor of behavioural science and psychology at Duke University, um, and just a generally amazing, super nice, incredible person. So yeah, welcome, Dan. Uh, Thank you. Lovely to be here. <laughs> um, and uh, just before we started this, I was, I was asking uh, where you were. You said you were in LA. To a, a fun thing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm here for a premiere of a of a TV show called The Irrational, and it's a it's a TV show that uh, I helped write, and it's uh, loosely based on my life. Uh, it's a show on NBC. Uh, airing airing tomorrow and um, very exciting and actually um you know being being involved in the writing and seeing something takes takes place and uh, seeing an actor saying my sentences <laughs> and actually his office is modeled after my office at duke oh, um wow. and <laughs> and it is it is amazing and and the the actor Jesse Martin, um, he he called me. So you know there was a pilot and then and so on. So it's been it's been going on for about a year there. And he told me how much he starts thinking like <laughs> like me. <I'm>, uh, <laughs> so so the day before yesterday he called me to check whether he was really thinking like me or or not. Um, but it's a real treat. It's a real treat to to see something written in such a different way and how the writers think and how much they respect science so you know when when we started i didn't know like if i say oh this is not how the experiment works they there's no discounts they you know they it's it's fiction yeah it's drama but um when i say something this is not how an experiment works so this is not how people think about the research assistants it's um they they take it seriously oh, and good. um and in, in this show, I have uh, the, the guy who is playing the professor, his ex-wife, his sister, and, and the two research assistants are the, the main character. And after a while, I took the two research assistants to, to dinner. <laughs> and after about two hours, I realized I'm treating them not like actors, but as my research assistants. I, we just <laughs> talked about science and research. <laughs> And and how to do things, but uh, yeah, it's it's really fun, really fun. Oh, that's amazing! And it, it's it's uh, I mean, I, I'd imagine your your whole research is around sort of you know human behavior and emotions, and I mean those were all great things to work with the storytelling. So, um, is it is it sort of like a, a Sherlock Holmes type uh, modern day? <laughs> yeah. So so every every episode there's a psychological force that is the villain, right? Right. So there's there's always a crime. And and there's a there's an attempt to solve it, and and it's always about one one aspect of of the human psyche that is is coming to play. Uh, think about revenge, or you know, I don't want to give it away, but uh, sure. that's that's what's happening. Oh, that's amazing, Nick. Um, so if anyone's uh, uh, in the US, <laughs> look for the Irrational on uh, NBC on Peacock, uh, and we'll, we'll hopefully everywhere else in the world will find it. Uh, in the next few weeks when it becomes a global smash hit. Um, but but <laughs> the reason why we wanted to chat today was because of this amazing uh, foot that you got up here. It was uh, absolutely fascinating. It was just got released a couple of days ago um, called Misbelief. And uh, it's a mind-boggling story uh, that that I think um, you know deals with the subject which has been rising in prominence sort of unfortunately i think in the last four years or so i, I actually it it's sort of well a lot of it, it seems to be about misinformation um and I, I i did a quick google search on the you know google trends and i saw you find this very sort of low line up until about march 2020 and then it just spikes and results yeah sort of triple and it, it sort of has stayed unfortunately very high since so yeah, um, I, what, what happened? <laughs> yeah. So, so first of all, let, let me just say that I don't like the term misinformation. Right. And I don't like the term misinformation because 
it makes us feel that the solution is simple. <laughs> there's misinformation, there's real information, we can fix it. I, I prefer the term corrosive information because one of the, the important thing is to realize that somebody who gets exposed to that is very unlikely to ever uh, to ever go to ever go back. Mm. But but uh, the the book and, and my story is that uh, as as COVID started, um, it was really the highlight of my academic career. Um, I think every government in the world and many businesses realize the importance of social science. Right? We keep on saying, "Hey, social science is important, important." All of a sudden, there's a virus. And everybody says social science is important. And there were questions about how to reduce domestic violence, how to do distant education, how to give money uh, to people, uh, whether we should give fines or rewards. Um, you know, the, 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 the number of questions, how do we get people to comply uh, with requests? How do we get... Uh, the, the, the social science questions were, were everywhere. And I was... Uh, I, I felt I was like contributing to the world. I uh, I was with two phones and my, I was like, you know, a control center answering questions from different countries, from different places. I felt I was the most useful I could ever be in my life. It was it was a tremendously, you know, not everything I had an answer, but but I, I did I did the best I could. And And then a few months later, yeah, I get an email from somebody I once knew. I'm, I, I once helped, and the email says, "Dan, how have you changed? Okay. Uh, how have you become like this?" And I, I say, "How, how, how exactly? What exactly do you mean?" And I get a long list of links, and I'll just describe one of them. Uh, that link describes how uh, I was uh, badly burned, which is true, right? Most of my body is is. 70% of my body was was burned. So how because I was burned and I was in hospital for three years, I started hating healthy people. And that's why I joined the Cabal and Gil, Bill Gates and the Illuminati to try and kill as many healthy people as possible. And and the rest of the videos and, and links and so on were uh, different types of accusations, different types of starting points and so on. Um, but all... All, all of the same uh, type. And, and my initial instinct was to just correct those people <laughs> that they were wrong. <laughs> and um, I, I do have to say that before I, I, I tried to correct them, I called some friends to ask them for advice and everybody said don't. <laughs> but I went ahead anyway. I, I, felt, I felt so strongly, this is to tell you that social science even knowing something about social science is no protection from not doing mistakes. But my instinct was so much that these people are just wrong. And if I only told them, they would get convinced. Right. And I spent the next month trying to convince them. Uh, I talked to people. I invited some people to uh, my house. I um, joined some online discussion groups. I joined things on Telegram. Lots of things. I think I only did damage. I I, I convinced I convinced one person uh, uh, during that that month, and I probably got thousands to 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 hate me even more. And then at the end of the month, I I realize that's not going to work. I'm a slow learner, and uh, and I decided to try and understand the problem. It was just incredible feeling of being villainized on wrong things and unable to talk to people, unable mm -hmm. to give them data, information, a a anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I decided to, to understand this. And I basically sat back and for the next two years, I just tried to understand things. I found about a 20 very, very serious misbelievers who I would talk to regularly to try and understand the world. I stopped trying to convince them. I gave up on them. I said, I just want to understand your, your worldview. Uh, I joined some of the discussion groups, watched a tremendous number of videos, did my own research. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, and, and it was very tough two years. It's very tough two years. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
at, at some point I, I thought I'll, I'll write this book because I, I realized that the problem is bigger than, than I thought, more complex than I thought, and more important than I thought. Um, if 10 years ago I asked you, what are the big challenges facing humanity? Uh, corrosive information or misbelief would not be there. Correct. Now it is. Now you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. every big problem that we want to save, that to, to improve together, whatever it is, uh, uh, misbelief is an enemy of, it's, it's, it's under, undermining a lot of our ability to work together and improve things. And what uh, I love, love in your book as well is you, you go through so many different stories. So obviously you, you do share your own story, which, which we'll carry on going into, but I, I love the way you've got stories about sort of uh, dogs, uh, JFK, <laughs> COVID, payday loans, uh, everything. Um, it, it, it's it, it, yeah. it's written in such a beautiful way. Again, you, you're a masterful storyteller. So everything is just, you know, everything is framed really beautifully. So if Thank you, you. If, you if, if someone is a little bit scared of this topic and might think it's overcomplicated, um, please don't... Uh, be, be worried the way that Dan's put it down there it, it, it's super easy to understand but um, yeah I mean it must have made you feel pretty uh, pretty ghastly I'd imagine yeah um, you know the, 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 the book the book is really if you can you can look at it as almost like an introductory textbook to psychology because in in the same way that uh, you know the cookie, is designed to attack human nature with the right combination of salt, sugar, and fat. Misbelief is designed to attack every aspect of our psychology, right? And and I described this this funnel of misbelief that starts with emotion, stress, cognitive, personality, and social. It's kind of, you know, mm. it's not all of psychology, but but it's a lot of psychology that is attacking us in in different phases. Of this, of this funnel of mis, of misbelief, and and causing people to act in very strange ways. And since since I started talking about this more generally, I I usually ask people, you know, do you have somebody in your circle, family, friend, close, not not so close, that has changed in some deep and fundamental ways over the last few years? And and the answer from everybody is is yes, there is somebody that I once thought was just like me and they have changed in such a way that I am not sure, like, who are they mm -hmm. any anymore? But but the book is not just about them. It's also about us, right? Because it's very easy to say, oh, it's these other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the reality is that all of us are susceptible to misbeliefs. And also... When, when you start exploring the nature of our beliefs and, and you take this task seriously, you, you start realizing that some of our closely held beliefs might not be as solid as, as we think they are. And it's a very healthy, uh, very healthy uh, process to go through. Yes. It, it, what I thought was interesting, one of the themes in the book is this sort of at the start, it seems like a, a lot of this is driven by people in in bad situations and it it can be something very small and benign there was a, a story i think you share about a, a a lady whose kid was chastised for losing their mask and then it goes you know that angers the parent who then goes online and like you know why why are we having to wear a mask anyway which then escalates yeah. in this sort of you know right <laughs> full blown on thing um it, it it's it's frightening to see how easy it can start, but what, what such a small thing can lead to such a... Yeah, a... And, and and there are two elements there. The, the first one is that, yes, it can happen to all of us, and, and the breeding ground for misbelief is really stress. That's important to realize. Right. Because when when you say to yourself, why this other person and not me? What what separates us? Maybe I'm just smarter. Or... No, no, no. Um, we shouldn't discount the people who go down this path and we shouldn't discount misbeliefs. Um, we need to understand that that they grow as a response to stress. So first of all, with the with the right level of stress or you know the wrong level of stress, we could all start adopting 
misbeliefs. That's important to understand. And the second is that misbeliefs are are a response to a real need, right? It's not that people just say, oh, let me wake up and let me start believing in whatever. Uh, no, mm. there's, a, there's a real need that those um, beliefs are, are a response to. It's not healthy. It's like an autoimmune problem, but, but it's a response. So imagine that somebody is stressed and they're not stressed of the type of being busy at work. They are stressed of the type of being a hard done by, feeling that life is not fair to them, that they have lost their job when other people haven't, that their kids don't like them when they like the other spouse, where, uh, you know, uh, financial help, anything, and, and stress accumulates. Mm. Mm. There's also this beautiful research showing that countries that have more violence have more conspiracy theories, right? Stress accumulates across domains. It's not as if, or oh, my stress comes from health, or my stress comes from my kids. It, it accumulates. Right. And now we feel stressed. And that's a very unhealthy uh, unhealthy state of, of, of emotional state. And we want to relieve that stress. So what do we want? We want a story. We want a story to explain why this is happening. Mm-hmm. And we also want a villain. Why do we want a villain? Because we want somebody else to blame, right? Imagine that the story said, oh, I'm just not that talented or I'm, <laughs> I'm not a nice person or whatever. That's not a good, a good answer. So we want a story. We want a villain. And also we want a complex story. And why right. do we want a complex story? Because it gives us a sense of control. It gives us a sense that we know something that other people don't. Oh, you think that? No, no, no. Here's a much, much more. All of a sudden, from being an underdog, I feel I'm, I'm on top because of that. Um, so, so, so then we, we gravitate to these stories. The internet is full of them. We find one. The moment we listen to it or hear it and so on, there's a short-term improvement in well-being. Oh, it's not my fault. It's this other person. It's the it's the immigrants, it's Bill Gates, it's whatever, whatever. But but that improvement is short lived. A little bit like a, a mosquito bite. It's short lived because it's it's good for now. But but long term, you get to wake up the next day and say, oh, but my goodness, the world is a bad place. Hmm. There's there's all these all these evil forces. So it's a short-term improvement, long-term deterioration. And then you say, oh, what did I do last time when I felt bad? Oh, I, I watched this villain thing. Oh, short-term improvement, long-term deterioration. And that, that's the starting point. And then, of course, there's lots of other elements that build on top of that. I wondered, um, I mean, I guess so two, two things I thought about when you were talking there was one was you mentioned other countries say so you wouldn't, when you read up on on a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that you do read up on ends to be ends up being sort of USA related stuff. Is this is it more of a problem? Do you think in the states, or is it is it sort of is that just because you know a lot of mainstream media, I guess, of your English speaking comes from the states? Um, I don't think it's just US. I right. don't think it's just US. Um, and you know, <laughs> US is getting better at that. Uh, and and so on, but it's not it's not just U.S. Um, you know, let's let's not talk about the U.K. But but you know, uh, Brazil, right? Yeah. It's not it's not just it's not just the U.S. It's it's in more and more places. And 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 look, COVID COVID was a, a an extraordinary time because of the amount of stress. Right. Is because people were home, and there there were some other evid- things that pushed it forward, but but it's very hard to turn the clock back mm. uh, on on that. So so and, you know, as we said, you know, there's stress, cognitive, personality, and 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 social. Think a little bit about the social part. So so in the social part, like I, you know, if if we said that stress is the building block. Uh, social is what seals the deal. Once once people get to the social element, uh, it's very hard to to turn back. Is, but, is social the same as community or different? 
it's it's part it's part of that but but community is broader than that so right. for example community uh, contributes to reduction of stress so if you ask <laughs> where do we get resilience from from the fact that people around us would help us if we need their help right as community becomes more fray stress becomes higher so so community is not exactly as as social it plays in in multiple in multiple places but in in the social part there's a, there's a couple of there's a couple of things the, the first thing is ostracism okay and and the story and the story of ostracism is actually a beautiful story so so this guy that started the research on on this uh, described how he walks in the park with his dog walks and walks and walks and he sees two people playing frisbee they play frisbee and somehow the frisbee falls next to his feet he picks it up he throws it to one of them and to his surprise the guy throws the frisbee back and okay. the three of them play for a few minutes and then they stop throwing it to him and and he just stands there <laughs> and they stop throwing it to him and he feels rejected now he didn't come to play with them they don't know him he's not their friend but he felt rejected and he went ahead and he started doing research on this so he invited he basically replicated this he invited people to come to an experiment but he said please wait here for 10 minutes outside i'll call you when the experiment is is ready and there was a participant but there were two other people that worked for him for the researcher right and he asked them to start throwing a ball between the three of them and for half the participant they they played the three of them for 10 minutes for the other participant they played between them for 5 minutes and then they stopped throwing it to the <laughs> to the real participant and then he checked what is the effect of you know meeting two people playing for 5 minutes and then feeling rejected for 5 minutes and it turns out the effect of very substantial uh they change optimism and well-being uh, they change desire to help other people they change altruism they they and and in fmri studies they get people to feel like they're in pain when this is happened in terms of the the brain mechanism now i don't know about you but i feel that sometimes when people kind of start going down the path of misbelief and and have uh some strange ideas i have not shown them enough empathy mm-hmm. that uh I, i i wouldn't say i ridicule them i'm i'm kind of a gentle person but i i make a little bit fun of them i have i stopped and you know if i make a little fun of somebody they probably perceive it as as big offense right, right. there's an asymmetry And I think that's the first thing we do where we see people with very different opinions and we basically reject them. And we reject mm-hmm. them in a in a very in a way that is probably more intense than we intend and it has a bigger effect on them. And and what happens now? They need to seek a different community. Right? And and where can they find it? Online. Yeah. And and if you go and look at these online communities they are incredibly loving. Uh mm-hmm. there was one guy who had a post about a uh, Nuremberg trials 2.0 for people who made crimes against humanity uh, during covid. And and very long posts description of my crimes and sins against humanity and at the end he they basically asked the question of whether i should get life in prison or public hanging and and people discuss that <laughs> now if you just look at the comments and there were about a thousand of them they sounded very lovely oh you're so smart love is so insightful like you know the amount of support was amazing mm-hmm. you would think that these people are there to solve you know poverty or or something uh but it's not for nothing that they give each other too much support again the psychological perspective is not to look at something and say it's a mistake but to say what need is it fulfilling those people were getting ostracized 
Like if you think about Macron, Macron said that they're not French, right? They were they were basically very strong offenses uh, against them. Very counterproductive. Very counterproductive. And um, anyway, so so the social has a few a few other elements. There's one other thing I wanted to that is important to mention, which is a very worrisome trend. And this is a trend called shibolet. And, and the story is as follows. There's a story in the Bible about two tribes that uh, went, went to war. Very, very bloody war. And, and at the end of this war, one is on one side of the river, the other one is on the other side of the river. And um, when they meet somebody, they want to know it's, if that person is from their side or from the other side. And Shibonot is the name of a plant, but the two tribes pronounce it differently. One said she bullet, one said sea bullet. So now I meet you and I say, how do you call this plant? If you say it the right way, I let you live. You say it the wrong way, I try to kill you. Now, when you think about what it means is when I show you the plant and I say, how do you say this word? I don't really care about the plant and I don't care about the words. What I care about is a signal of your identity. Are you among us? Or do you belong to the other to the other group? And we start using the term shibolet in this in this sense. Who do you belong to? Mm. And and if you look at it from this perspective, at for example, a lot of political discourse, you would say that sometimes people are saying things that you don't think they believe, but they're saying it as loyalty. And, and of course, if I just say something run of the mill, I don't show my true loyalty. I have to say something really extreme to show my loyalty to the cause. So when you and I listen to a discussion, we might say, oh, this is discussion about the truth. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not a discussion about fact. It's discussion though somebody is trying to signal their loyalty to the group. And I'm not following very closely uh, British politics, but but we see it a lot in in other countries, and you can tell me if you if you think that you see signs of that uh, also in British politics, and and not just the politicians, but in discussions where people are really saying things they don't necessarily believe, but are showing their their identity, and of course once they say it, over time they they might forget that they started with it as a shibolet and now it's kind of accepted truth. It's a fascinating one. I, mean, I, I was reading an article from um, another lovely chap, uh, Professor Galloway, the um, funny chap from uh, New York. He was saying that uh, he wrote an article the other day about how he was worried about the sort of breakdown in religion and how that has broken down communities. And, and he was looking at research on when people used to be more religious, it's sort of a people who are members of religious organizations tend to live longer, be uh, yeah. more endure about, about things. And, you know, it, it's, I, I was thinking that in the articles, well, it says it's sort of research in, or religion in the US, I think is down to 20%. Um, and I, I wonder whether it's those kind of things leave a void for these kind of you know, when a pandemic does come, like Pinti Panti, we, we, we don't, in most places in the West, we don't, you know, our parents aren't necessarily even close by to us. We're living alone in a city, isolated. Um, yep. it, it, no wonder these kind of things tend to happen a little bit more. Perhaps they would. I mean, religion has its own issues, I'm sure, but yeah. it's, it's not, so the things are happening. So, so I agree with you in, in two ways. Uh, first of all, in terms of resilience. Right, so religion is is usually not just the belief in a god or some entity; it's also a community around that, mm. and having that community is important. the The second thing is that when you have a physical community, uh, some people are going to have different opinions, and you'll have to basically realize that some people have a different opinion. Uh, Online, you could choose something that have just your opinion. But but the other thing that, and this was a, you know, it's it's an obvious uh, statement, but it struck me one night. 
I talked to, to, to one misbeliever uh, in Germany and, and all of a sudden I realized how difficult life is for the misbelievers. Now, and this is a, a very big difference from believing in God. If, if you believe in God, you believe that the world is governed by some good force. God is generally good. Yes, sure. you know, the, sometimes there's a devil and sometimes the devil wins, but m- mostly mostly it's God and mostly you feel that there's a, a good force guiding you. So, so forget the social element. Uh, that's, that's a separate issue, but the belief is in, inherently about goodness. If you are a misbeliever and you believe that it's not just that Pfizer is coming up with the vaccine and they want to make money, but that the plot is much larger and there's a cabal that smuggles kids that, you know, uh, da, 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 and you wake up in a terrible state. You wake up feeling that there's forces that are bigger than you, that are conniving, that are trying to do harm to you and your kids. And that's just a terrible way to live. Hmm. So so I think that as as religion goes down, we lose community, we lose resilience, but but we also have a chance to adopt notions about evil controlling the world. And and for me the term is belief. It's not just the belief about something that is not so. It's also about the perspective of the person. It's that the person is looking at life from not a skeptical perspective, or, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but from a perspective of evil forces out to get me and everything and everything that I see is, is evidence of guilt. Like I was on some radio show uh, a couple of days ago and, and somebody wrote me about a salmonella poisoning that happened in the U.S. You know, happens. Mm. Not for this person. For this person, this was part of a plot to uh, get people to be unhealthy. Mm. So, so, so the moment you become a misbeliever and, and truly adopt um, a tenant... Uh, like this, and it's not just something that you don't care about. It becomes something central in your in your personality, and that's the perspective in which you look at the rest of life. That's incredibly damaging. So I guess I guess then how how can we try and protect ourselves against these things so that we don't fall into these traps? How yeah how can we yeah is it is it an environmental thing or are there just some steps that we can do or a bit of both? I guess. Yeah, so, so there's there's a lot of little things that we can do. Uh, I, I call these sections hopefully helpful. Um, and then there are big things we need to take as society. But but let's let's talk about the things we can do individually. So first of all, we talked about resilience, right? Uh, how do we give, like when we see people starting adopting these misbeliefs, our role is to support them. It's very tough because they start having strange opinions and we, we feel the need to tell them that they're wrong, but but we need to create resilience. We also need to create resilience for ourselves, right? Um, you know, each of us can think about, you know, how much are we investing in friendship, support network, mm-hmm. uh, a deep, supportive, romantic uh, love. You know, it's 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 kind of a a bank of resilience that we need to to invest for ourselves and for others. So that's that's one component. Uh, we certainly need to stop ostracizing people. That's a, that's just very very unhelpful and counterproductive. And um, there's a couple of things that we could do on the cognitive side as well. Um, I'll, I'll just give you one example, but there's something called the illusion of explanatory depth. Uh, and I, I demonstrated this once. There's, there's lots of demonstration, but one of mine were with a flush toilet. 
So I came to people, I said, hey, do you understand how a flush toilet works? They said, yes, of course. I said, okay, uh, here are all the pieces, can you assemble one? Uh, nobody, nobody managed to assemble it. And then I said, and how much do you think now that you understand the flush toilet? And people change their beliefs in their knowledge. And, and this has been demonstrated for lots of things. You understand how a zipper works and how a lox works and how a virus works, how vaccine works, how a plane works, everything, helicopter. And, and it turns out that, that in these places where knowledge is low but our confidence is high, these are very dangerous places. These are places where we could adopt a very strongly a, a, a misbelief. And, and the nice thing about this perspective is that there's a way to help. So I can say, you know, Chris, uh, you seem to be saying that the elections were stolen. Help me understand exactly how could they be stolen? Like where exactly would it work? Uh, is it is it happening when somebody marks something, somebody changes it? It's in the, this and and talk about the the exact mechanism where this is this is happening. And mostly we find that when when we do this with people, they say, "Well, you know, I'm not so sure." As I as now, you don't attack somebody because when you attack mm -hmm. somebody, they don't listen to you; they counter argue. Yeah, you basically say, "I'm with you. Let just let just help me understand this." And, and there's even a nicer result showing that this is cross domains. So, you know, maybe, maybe you believe the elections were stolen and I don't want to attack you to, to talk to you about that just yet. I can start with the zipper <laughs> because when people understand that there's a, it's not as effective, but it's also a little bit effective when we say, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I should be um, less confident. And then, of course, you know, there's lots of things we need to do as society. We need to treat the media differently. We need to think about what we do with social media. Uh, we need to think about what we do against polarization. So there's there's other. It's not as if, you know, uh, just resilience and just the illusion of exploratory depth and just stopping at ostracizing is is the will fix everything. It's it's where we as individuals can start. But, but we also need to recognize the importance of the problem and do something more, more generally. So, so have you met someone who, um, I was vehemently believed in flat earth theory. Do you, it, I guess it is, it's, it, do, you, do you need to convince them that that's wrong in the first place or, 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 or yeah. do you just sort of have to make a judgment call as like, well, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm happy with it. They're happy with their beliefs and move on. Um. Yeah. So, so one of the problems with with misbeliefs, as we said, is that it's a it's a perspective from which to view the rest of the world. And it's the bigger issue on on hand is trust. And and this is why when people start misbelieving, they start misbelieving other things. It doesn't end. With, with one thing. Like if you think about, um, you know, let's say COVID is basically over, let's, let's, let's say, um, all the people who dedicated three years of their lives to this are not going to close shop. Remember, they've left their friends and family. They found a new, a new group. Uh, they view everything from this perspective now they they go against the UN. They're going against the the World Health Organization. You know, it's not. Um, so so when you see somebody, okay, imagine you dated somebody who believed in flat Earth, right? Uh, you know, you could take them home to meet your parents. Like it would be a little bit embarrassing, but you could. Uh, if you met somebody who was a COVID denier, that would be tougher because it, it would feel that they are, uh, you know, hurting the, the, the common good. Mm. Somebody who believes in flat earth doesn't change the shape of the earth. Yes. Somebody who believes that there's no COVID can change the actual risk of COVID. But, so you could say, oh, I don't care. If you, if you believe in something that is not, but if it becomes a central tenant in their life and their personality and so on, 
then then they're likely to start believing other things as well, right? So, so I would say that um, the the real issue here is not a specific belief; it's this perspective, this suspicious negative perspective on on everything. Okay, so sort of uh, yeah. <laughs> Deal with it at your own peril, then it won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's it's easy to kind of kick down the road and say, "Oh, it's just the beginning. I really don't want to deal with it." But it will only get worse. Yeah, it is interesting what you say. I mean, it makes sense. You see that in other areas as well. Yeah, it's again, these things often seem to be a slippery slope. It's sort of start tall, start start small, and and, and go deeper. I, I'd imagine, yeah, you know, social media and probably AI doesn't don't help these things a huge amount either. Um, no. How do you, particularly probably with kids who, you know, haven't, you know, they, they've only grown up with that and that's probably where they get their their main source of news from as well. So, I mean, what, yeah. what how do you, is that sort of something that, that maybe the social media companies themselves need to deal with more or government needs to deal with more? Or is that just something that we as, you know, as parents or as, as individuals need to be more aware of? Like, what? Well, I guess is there again like anything any questions you can ask yourself to stop yeah. yourself going down that wrong rabbit hole. So, so, so I think that all of the above are are correct. I think social media platforms need to deal with it. I think we as parents need to deal with it, and so on. And 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 I'm trying to talk with as many social media companies that I that I can and. Uh, you know, sometimes they say, oh, let's just censor things. Um, censoring is not the right approach. First of all, it's mm-hmm. it's very tough to, to do efficiently. But mm-hmm. if I think about my daughter who is 17 and I think about her feed, I don't want her feed to be fully clean of conspiracy theories. Right. I don't want her to have zero exposure to those things. I think she needs to start seeing those things, dealing with them, developing critical thinking. You know, the solution is not to say, "Oh, let's just uh, protect you against against that." That's that's not a good recipe for life. So, you know, I I hope that social media will start thinking about information diet per person rather than about videos as a unit of analysis but but personally what what i think we can do is it's our responsibility to do this for our kids until the social media uh, platform <clears throat> wake up or are forced to wake up or something where you actually want to expose your kids to alternative views you want to expose your your kids to uh, you know corrosive information, but you want to do it in a way that helps them develop a, a critical thinking and stopping and, and also help them figure out that they might not want to share it. You know, one of the one of the challenges in social media is what is the share button really about? So imagine that you see something absolutely ridiculous that you completely don't believe in. Versus you see something amazing that you really believe in. Sharing is the same in both in both cases. How is the person that you share this information with is going to react? And are they going to understand your intention? They are not. You know, we have this um, kind of very simplistic way. We don't separate claims about facts from opinions, from entertainment. Um, we don't separate what the thumbs up or liking is from do I do I find it funny? Do I find it ridiculous and interesting? Do I find it um, so? So the language is is very ambiguous in this in this regard, and and especially with sharing, I think people need to understand that whatever they think they're doing, they're endorsing. I, I loved it. You say in the book about ambiguity and you know it's in it's another skill that we need to learn is how to get very comfortable with ambiguity yeah 
Um, I, I guess we were always trying to search for meaning and and look, look for an answer. Um, and, and sometimes you, you, I think you share an example of Ockham's razor. Is it the? the, the sort of, um, often it is just totally random and. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. The, the question about how do we interpret things is very important. And that's why mm. I think skepticism is very healthy. Um, skepticism is to say, I don't know if it's A or B, but I'm not going to decide yet. But by the way, very hard to do in a world in which you're stressed. When you're stressed, very hard to say, oh, let me hold this multiple hypothesis uh, in mind. But, but learning to enjoy the ambiguity and saying, I really don't know, let me, let me hold judgment and come back to this and, and so on is, is incredibly important. And, you know, that, that was one of the things with COVID is, yes, airborne, no airborne. Yes, surfaces, no air surfaces. Yes, masks, no mask. It was, it was so hard to, to keep what was really going on because very hard to do science in in kind of out there in the world um so 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 the the ambiguity was inherent uh, to the situation by the way lots of important questions there's so much ambiguity um you know uh, think about think about brexit think about immigration think about uh, European Union, v very hard. Like th these, these are very, very tough questions. The answer is not is not very clear for for any of those, and 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 we don't want to jump to conclusions. Yes, it it it, it is uh, complex. So you you talk in the book again about just the complexity of human nature. It is it is a thing. I think it was a lovely experiment. You had you talked about a. Uh, an experiment done with uh, um, it someone asking a researcher some random questions on a suspension bridge versus in a in a normal area, and they they sort of confuse confuse their fear and uh, 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 with with love. I think of the the researcher or something. Which I thought was that's right. That's it. With attraction, we we don't know where our emotions come from, and we don't right. know what to hang them, and it can come on the on the wrong on the wrong reason. Um. So, so you know, the book the book just came out uh, a few days ago, and I uh, have given more more talks uh, about it. But I had a funny realization, um, and I didn't I didn't think about it as I was writing the book. I just had it afterward. But you know, we talked about the fact that the the misbelievers are experiencing stress, and they try to come up with a story, and the story has a villain, and the story is complex, and and so on. And what I realized is I did the same thing exactly. So, so here's my life, death threats, attacks, uh, and so on, stress. Um, I, I, very hard, very hard. You know, death threats sound like it's, it, it was very, 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 very tough. Mm -hmm. um, and I also needed a story and I did an explanation. <laughs> and and I think this book is this story, <laughs> and and at the end, you know, my villain is 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 human nature and and the technology we've built, we've built around it. Um, mm. But but I think that much like the the misbelievers, I I went on a journey to to explain uh, what was going on. And now mm. I didn't do it very quickly. It took me a long time, and I. I, I I try to 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 do this, but but I think it's similar that my coping mechanism for all this uh, misery and stress and so on was to find a story and explain it, um, and and this is eventually the book. And it and what an amazing book it is. Um, and I know we we're sort of running out of time, so I I mean I I think the things I took from here are we need to work on our empathy for others. Um, I love uh, what you say about trust. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be one of those people who, who overly trusts in everyone. And I, I think, I believe it serves me better in the long run than, than yeah. not being trusted. I think it's the same with humanity. I think you mentioned in the book that um, you sort of tend to have the same approach. Yeah. Um, 
And then I also love what you talked about, the sort of curiosity and critical thinking and sort of working on that. Um, and I guess trying to look for areas where if we are perhaps a bit stressed, uh, you know, are there are there less hectic communities that we can maybe join? Um, maybe yep. some gardening or something or dissipating <laughs> or something yeah. that's more a civil good. Uh, but um, yeah, look, uh, I, I wish you the very best for this book. It's it, it's marvellous. Um, yeah, please do, if you're listening to the podcast still, go out and, and buy it. It's available with all good bookshops and all bad bookshops too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, it's uh, it's full of lovely stories and uh, and just, yeah, lots of incredible behavioural biases. So yeah, Dan, you've done an incredible job again. Smashed it out of the park. It's been such an honor chatting with you and i really appreciate the time you've uh, taken to speak with us today my pleasure and looking forward to meeting face to face next time i'm in the the uk very much thank you thanks